Hi there, everybody, and welcome to another live session of Mentor Minutes. I do these sessions every day live over on my Facebook page, and it's just a Q&A session. Real questions from real leaders from around the world about real situations that they're dealing with in the workplace. And I like to start these sessions out while we're queuing up some visitors here and queuing up some questions here in the comment section with some questions I didn't get a chance to get to yesterday. And somehow I missed this one from Deep. It popped up right in the timeline, but uh, I want to follow up with him today on it. And it's, how do I get respect in the workplace? Sandra, so great to see you here. So the question is, how do you get respect in the workplace? The first thing that you do, this isn't surprising, if you want something, you have to give something first. So if you want respect, then you need to give respect to those around you. And you need to give it consistently, whether it be employees, whether it be peers, whether it be superiors, you need to give that same level of respect. Now, a lot of times the question is, is well, what does that respect look like? Well, you listen to them. You solicit their opinions. You give them ownership. If you want them to have more ownership of their operation, of their workflow, then give them that ownership by asking them those questions. That's one of the main keys. If you want more respect, you need to be giving it more consistently throughout everybody that's in your organization. The other thing to do with respect, and it's great for employees in particular, and I think this is what you're getting at deep, is really that respect from um, employees, and that is give the reasons why. And this works for everybody. So when you come up with a decision, when you come up with a question or with a possible course of action or an idea, give the reason why it's, it, it's going to work. Why are you asking somebody to upsell every time they have a, a call that they're dealing with? Why are you asking somebody to complete the number of invoices or the number of orders shipped in a particular day? Why are you asking? Why is that important? When you tie your decisions to a good reason, then people understand where you're coming from a little bit better and they're more apt to give your decisions in the future that weight. The other cheat to this is to actually tie your decisions, not just, not just a reason why, why it's important, but tie it to the overall goals of the organization. If people know, because you're talking about it, that the decisions that you're making and the changes you're making in your department and the improvements you're making and the training that you're conducting, all of those things are aligned with the top one, two, or three goals of the organization, well, then that means that what you are doing is you're, you're basically kind of pulling some of that importance and some of that respect that those big goals get into you and your circle of influence. And so whether it's increasing sales 15%, decreasing costs, increasing profitability, moving up customer service scores, if you're tying your decisions and your actions, your thoughts, your ideas to those big things, then you can basically kind of catch a ride on those big, huge things. Nilanjana, great to see you here. So Deep, I hope that's helpful for you. Um, again, sorry I didn't get to that question yesterday. It was right in the flow there and somehow I just skipped over it. But uh, thrilled that you asked it, and I hope that helps you out there. Second question, I'll get to you in a second, Neil and John. I just want to kind of clear out some things. It was a big day as far as getting some questions anonymously. Um, well, not anonymously, I know about them, but I'll talk about them here anonymously through private messaging on Facebook. And so if you have a question and you missed this session, then by all means, email me, cm at cameronmorsey.com and ask me the question. I'll go ahead and throw it up here anonymously. Um, you can also private message me on Facebook or just add it to the comment section. I always check out the comment section before I jump on to the next session just to see if there's anything that I missed. So you're always welcome to ask those questions there or as we've had people jump online, go ahead and drop down into the comment section and ask the questions there. Um, the next one I have is dealing with a disruptive or manipulative employee, but the executives won't let you discipline them because they are an expert in a certain area and they don't want this person running away. And what I want to do in these cases where you have those disruptive manipulative employees who are experts in particular areas, and this goes for everything. If you want to fix something, if you have a problem that needs to be addressed, realize that you are going to have to spend time and effort to fix it. 
Now, sometimes those are fun things. Those are opportunities. Those are new sales initiatives. And sometimes it's disruptive, disruptive and manipulative employees. And that's not fun. But realize to address any of these, they're not going to go away by themselves. You have to put the energy. So what I want you to do in this case with this employee is spend a little bit more time and effort coming up with ways that they can do their job better with, I want to say, a greater workload. So what you're looking to do is disruptive and manipulative employees can do that when they have that free time. So what you want to do is you want to decrease that free time that they have. What you do is you're spending more time. You're giving them more of your attention. Now, it cuts down on the time, but that's not really what we're after here, all right? That's a simple thing, but that's gonna go away. And Steve, good to see you here in Oklahoma, very nice. Hope it's not too hot over there for you. I've got a cousin over there. Um, but what you want to do is when you spend that time and that attention, you're able to invest in that employee and you're able to see specific instances of behavior that you can address. So they're disruptive. Well, how are they disruptive? They're manipulative. How are they manipulative? And so when you're spending more time with that employee, and realize, I realize this is not fun. When you have an employee that's disruptive, manipulative, they're not fun to hang around and you don't want to be spending time with them. But if you want to fix something, this is how you're going to do it. And you point to specific instances of that behavior and you talk them through what you would have preferred to see and why what they did wasn't in the best interest of the organization and themselves. Tie back, it was a big topic yesterday was the WIFM, what's in it for me? That's all motivation right there is what the person gets out of it. And so if you want them to stop that behavior, show why that behavior is making their life more difficult and what they'll get out of having better behaviors. Oh, from the Scottish border, Sandra, I have an old teacher. My goodness, I have ties all over the place. I have an old teacher that's over in Scotland right now. Um, but what you are hoping to do is be able to coach them through. And so you want to discipline them for their behaviors. You can't, and that's just the reality. But what you can do is you can dive a little bit deeper. And what happens in a lot of these cases is those de de behaviors diminish as you spend more attention with the employee, or time and attention with the employee. And you're also able to coach those things out just a little bit more because of that. And yes, don't get me wrong, it goes without saying that not being able to discipline an employee because they're an expert in a certain area is a terrible way to lead. And it it, it is not in the long-term best interest of all the other employees. Hey, great, you're keeping that expert employee, but what is it doing to the productivity of all of the other employees? And so for those people out there who are thinking about taking it easy on somebody because they're a high performer, realize that they are affecting the performance of everybody around them. And that's often a greater performance impact than just having them address things. Um, so great question. Appreciate it. Uh, next one comes in with an individual and it's a difficult situation moving um, from a retail environment. And I have some experience in retail and need to move on and out of the industry. Lots of experience. And what you are finding in the workplace, I'm dancing around just to keep them anonymous. Um, what you're finding in the workplace is that even though you've been an assistant store manager and even though you've been a district trainer for a long time, your skill set doesn't match up with what you're seeing out there. And what I'm telling you is you're wrong. Your skill set absolutely applies for manager positions and certainly supervisor positions in a number of different areas. And what I will tell you about that is and you'll see this on here. If, if I pulled everybody who's live right now, tune in in the comments and let us know where you're tuning in from. Where in the world, what country are you tuning in from? Everybody that's online right now in the comment section, let us know there. The reason I'm having you do that is because the biggest struggle with leadership and the biggest struggle with management is dealing with human beings. So whether somebody is from Jordan or South Africa or Pakistan or Australia or Great Britain or France or the United States, dealing with people is the big struggle. So your experience as an assistant store manager gives you an enormous amount of management experience. Your experience as a trainer gives you an enormous amount of experience. The responsibility that you were given by your organization to be the district trainer is huge. Will, it's good to see you here. So 
I want you to not look at yourself as not having, yeah, okay, you're moving from a retail environment to, I'll use another one that I have in my experience, a call center environment. I'll tell you right now, because I made that transition, that the tools that I needed to be successful in that next position, I learned in the other position. And Willis is from Johannesburg. I mentioned South Africa. So the, the experience that you've gained absolutely is transferable. You do have to be creative, and that's what I tell people. There's a lot of people that have never had a supervisor or manager position, but have been a trainer. And I tell them that's supervisory experience. Training is a huge aspect of management. And so look back on all of your experience. What I want you to look for is I want you to look for the accomplishments. All right, and this goes for everybody out there who's tweaking their resume or thinking about another job. The important thing to include on a resume is your accomplishments, not what your responsibilities were. It's great that you had those responsibilities, but there have been a ton of people that have had those responsibilities. And the question is, is why are you any better than they were at those same responsibilities? And your accomplishments get to that. So did you tr change any of the standard operating procedures? Did you drive particular results in your organization? Have you coached up performance? Have you... What have you done? What financial metrics did you hit? What goals did you hit? What accolades did you get as you know manager of the month or whatever it happens to be? Get in touch with those accomplishments. Look at those and you'll see that those tie towards other responsibilities in other jobs. I realize it's difficult for those of you out there that want to switch industries. It is difficult. And you will face some of those situations where the people that are interviewing want somebody who has experience in that particular industry. Hey, that, that's fine, all right? I will tell you they are missing out and that you need to cast a wider net, but that's a discussion that I need to have with them that you really can't when you're sitting across from them in an interview. But look to have, um, look to have an open mind for what you, you can go into, but I guarantee you with that much management experience, there are a ton of jobs out there that will match up. Again, you have to be a little bit creative, but the big aspects of management and leadership are universal across industries and across countries. And so that's what that's my big message for you. Now I did have a follow-up and then I'm gonna dive into some of the questions that uh, I've been receiving here in the comment section. And if you have any questions, struggles, anything you've been dealing with that's been on your mind, drop them down into the comment section and I'll tackle them there. The other question I had was, again, in regards to interviewing, and that is, how do you address the uh, interview question, why did you resign? What I tell people is that you want to be as transparent as possible. That being said, you do need to phrase it in a positive light. I like to be very honest in interviews, but there is a little bit of massaging that needs to go on. And so if you didn't get along with your boss, don't talk about it from a boss perspective. Talk about it from an organization perspective and talk about what you did to deal with that particular situation. But if you resigned from a job, there was a reason for it. I didn't like the hours. I didn't like the pay. Um, I didn't like the leadership development. What you can always say, one of the great defaults, and for most of you, you want to go out and you want to climb the ladder, is I wasn't getting the sort of development that I wanted from a skill set perspective, and I wasn't getting the opportunities to move up in the organization. Patty, great to see you here from New York again. Um, so you really hit on those. Those are the two reasons that I tell people it's okay to leave a job. When you're not developing your skill sets, and when you don't have the ability to move up in the organization. Those are two great ones to throw out there, and likely you weren't getting the sort of development that you would have wanted. You didn't have those opportunities, otherwise you wouldn't have resigned from the position. And it's, it's in those cases where you be truthful, but you find kind of the positive aspect of it from an employer standpoint. When you tell people that you weren't getting the ability to move up in the organization, then that's something that is actually a positive because you want to be hiring people that want to move up in an organization. The other one that moving from big companies to small companies is I want to see the scope of my position and the scope of my skill set increase because that's what happens. Big organizations tend to be more siloed, whereas small organizations have a larger breadth of things that they cover. And so that can be something where that's something that interests me about this job. 
That's the other way of handling the resignation thing is flipping the question and not answering it, which I don't necessarily like to do. But in a pinch, you can say why you're interested. It can reinforce why you're interested in that particular position. So great questions um, that I received offline for those that wanted to stay anonymous there. And Dorothy, I'll get to yours in just a second, but I queued up a, another question or two here. Nil and Jana, always good to see you here, Nil and Jana. And she starts us off with our first question on the live session, and that is, why some of the management talks of ingratiations? Does it really have a positive impact on bosses? Okay, so I'm taking ingratiation to be, for lack of a better term, uh, sucking up, showing deference. Um, showing respect, those might be the more positive aspects of things. And the, we kind of got into that with inspect. I don't like sucking up to a boss. I like being helpful for your leader. And I do think it is a responsibility of everybody out there to be helpful for your leader. It doesn't mean that you are glossing over their faults. It means that you are helping them to deal with them. And that may be taking on some aspects of the position yourself to be able to help them out because everybody has strengths and everybody has weaknesses. So be respectful of them. But most of all, I prefer not to say ingratiate yourself to them. I prefer to say be helpful to your boss. That helps your boss develop. That helps you stay in the loop and create a dialogue with that very important person in your career. And it exposes you to some different things. But really, a leader is all about helping. You wanna help your employees perform better so that you can help your organization achieve the results that it wants. You wanna help your peers so you smooth out how the operation is functioning. It's so much, that servant leadership aspect is about helping. So don't ingratiate, help your leader. And I think what you'll see is the relationships improve and what you actually end up getting as far as responsibilities and projects are create, get larger and larger in scope as you become more of a resource for the person who potentially decides whether you move up in the organization. That's never a bad thing. All right, next one is how to deal with team leaders who are not self-motivated. Also, their behavior has direct impact on team performance. What you want to do is get clear on expectations. First and foremost, motivations, you know, you can get past people that are poorly motivated by getting clear on the expectations that you're going to hold them to. And so this comes up a lot when you have people that are, you know, nearing retirement, for instance, is one of the things that I get clear on, is get clear on what the expectations are. What are the expectations for satisfactory performance, good performance, and excellent performance? Tier it if you can. But that holds everybody accountable to a certain level of performance. So regardless of whether they're motivated, you've been talking about the right things. You've been talking about those clear expectations that they need to meet. And then you can try to hold them accountable for it. All right. The other thing, motivation. I'm on a big kick on this as far as what's in it for them. All right. Their behavior has a direct impact on everybody else. What is the minimum amount of positive behavior? that they can give to get the maximum benefit. And what you talk about is the benefit that they are going to be, they are going to be receiving, not you, not the organization. It may have an effect on that, but what is their benefit? What do they get out of it? And how does it make their life easier to exhibit the behaviors that you're after? And this is, of course, unique to the behaviors, unique to the organizations. And I'm not denying that it is difficult to get creative in a number of these cases, all right? But really tie what's in it for them to go for under that motivation, but get clear on expectations, those baseline expectations on everybody. That way, regardless of whether they're motivated or not, they at least know what they need to do. Then start tackling those behaviors with how it makes their life easier and what they're getting out of doing the correct thing as opposed to what is viewed as the easy thing. What I will tell you is a lot of bad behaviors are a misalignment of that easiness principle. They are taking the short term easy and making it more difficult for themselves long term instead of taking the difficult short term thing and making it easier for themselves in the long term and flipping that mindset around is one of the most important things that leaders can do to change the behavior, change the culture, and change the dynamic in their organizations is flipping that behavior. 
A lot of that is instant gratification. So figure out ways to gratify them in the instant case for behaviors that match with the long term. It may be contests, it may be shout outs. We talk about putting performance up on the wall where every day they're going to get some sort of reinforcement or some sort of acknowledgement for the correct behaviors in the short term that benefit everybody in the long term. Hope that was helpful for you, Neil and John. I know there were some big concepts in there, uh, but uh, I, think, I think rolling with a few of those, you'll start seeing the momentum turn around. Uh, Doris, good to see you here from Germany um, on dealing with people. How would you deal with a situation where one employee has stepped back during a very big merger, stepping away from a worldwide position due to health issues, now in a regional position, and it seems that the new boss, oops, sorry, too much scrolling, the new boss is ghosting her, means not being invited, not being invited to meetings, not keeping informed. And <sighs> difficult dynamic. So first of all, the, the former manager who took that step back for health reasons, you need to respect that. And this ghosting, as you call it, I like that terminology, uh, is part of that. What you may do, instead of it not inviting her to meetings or something like that, look to find a way of tuning this person in to the meeting notes that come out of the meetings. So it may be that they don't have to spend 30 minutes, 60 minutes in that meeting, that they can actually get the notes. That's one of the ways that I tell people to actually cut down on the number of attendees. The more attendees you have to the meeting, the less that actually gets accomplished. And so many of the attendees can just be informed with the meeting minutes after the fact. What you can also look to do is and I almost hesitate to go this route, but find some way of being a liaison. That's what you, That's what I'm really going for here between the new boss and the old boss. The new boss is concerned about still having the old boss in the organization for very good reasons. All right, they're, they're, that dynamic, that relationship, and why you're concerned about the old boss is exactly what this person is getting at. They need to be able to set their own course and not have that, questioning that the employees might have. So a couple of ways that you can be a liaison. A, talk to your old boss about some of the things that are going on and some of the advice that she or he would recommend in this particular case so that you can then relay that on to the new boss. Also, look to translate the reason why for your new boss. Okay, one of the most important things, what they need to do when they step into that position, especially if the old boss is still with the organization, is that when they are making decisions, when they are setting courses of actions, when they have ideas, they need to be explaining to the team why it is important, how they came up with that methodology and what they see taking place. There's more explanation that needs to take place so that people understand them and with that understanding and that communication comes trust. You can step into that breach and when the new boss comes out with a directive or an idea, you can fill in the blanks as the why, why it's important and reinforce that sort of thing. Um, again, be that sort of liaison. But the more confident the new boss is in their position and in their authority, the more apt they will be to be able to include that regional manager in. So you want to encourage yourself, your teammates to show that sort of respect and build that confidence in the new boss so that the old boss can come in and you can gain all the benefits. I understand you want to gain all the benefits of that expertise from your old boss so that you're not missing a beat and so that everything goes really well. But look to step into the breach and I don't want to say pump up the ego of the new boss. I don't want that. That's kind of a byproduct of it. But make sure that you're helping them do the right thing and helping to build that confidence. And that's something that will allow them to more easily bring the regional manager into things. In the meantime, absolutely keep the regional manager informed. Informing the regional manager on what's going on at that higher level is something that everybody should be doing. So you're not out of bounds doing that. Asking them for that advice on what they think, that gets into that gray area just a little bit, and I'd be mindful of that with the, with the new boss, but really look to boost that up. The quicker that boss becomes more confident and the quicker they gain the trust of everybody in the organization, the more easily and more apt they will be to reach out to the regional manager. Also, coach the regional manager. 
hey, you might wanna reach out to so-and-so, they're doing this, it's great, whatever else. You can try to coach them on how exactly they should be giving their feedback so that it's not seen as them overstepping their bounds. Really interesting uh, question, Dorth. I appreciate that one, um, and I hope I was helpful in, in some aspect. Hey, Michelle's from Lubbock, Texas, of old relatives that used to be in Lubbock. So lots of ties today with everybody who's tuning in from around the world. Uh, Melissa has our next question, and I am caught up on questions, so if you've got any, drop them down into the comment section. I'll handle them in real time here. Uh, Melissa's question is, how to deal with upper management not having your back in situations because they don't want to lose a bad employee because we're understaffed? Basically, accepting bad behavior. Difficult situation, Melissa. I totally understand it. I've been in similar situations before where you don't want to discipline, you don't want to fire people because you can't bring enough people into the organization or you're going to have too big of a lag. There's a risk there. So what happens in this case, and, and I would classify this as poor leadership. Don't get me wrong. That kind of goes without saying in so many of these cases. I'm try not trying to excuse the bad behavior of leadership in these situations. What this becomes is it then becomes, and you've already recognized this, more work for you. And if you want to deal with the situation and you want to see it improved, it's going to take work. Everything does. So with all of those disclaimers in place to start out with, you want to get clear on expectations again, and you want to start addressing the bad behavior wherever you can. And it can be just calling up. Maybe you can't move up the progressive discipline ladder in regards to certain behavior, but you can call it out. You can coach it. You can describe what you would have rather seen. You can talk about the effects of that behavior and you can show them why it is easier for them to not exhibit that behavior in the future. Yes, you don't have this, the stick behind you of discipline and eventual termination behind it. But even just addressing and having those conversations, nobody likes having those conversations. At a bare minimum, it's, for somebody who's just tuning out, it's a waste of time. So nobody likes having those. So those conversations themselves are a deterrent. And over time, as you get better at figuring out ways to deal with particular individuals, you can actually see this turn around just a little bit. But start working a little bit more on motivation of the team. Look to build up the defenses of the people around them. How are they motivated? All right, just think back on it. What gets their juices flowing? Or ask them, is it you know, team contests? Is it potlucks at the end of, end of the week where everybody brings in the, a dish and everybody eats together? Is it having a flexible schedule? Is it camaraderie and teamwork? That sort of thing. Get clear on what it is that motivates them and you can build up their defenses around that and it also just lifts everybody along. All right, you can have that negative Nelly, but if you drop that person in a great environment that's positive, that's motivated, that person will lift up. They may not ever lead the way as far as motivation and performance is concerned, but they'll at least get lifted up. So tackle it directly with the employee, again, those conversations are discipline in and of themselves, but also work on the motivating factors of everybody around them. So you're handling it directly and indirectly, but that's something that can help move that organization. It takes time, it takes effort, and I know it sucks, but it is what it is, and that's the way that you can kind of handle it and try to manage it forward instead of just coping with it. Try to come up with actions that move it forward. Um, again, hope that was helpful, Melissa. Mahmoud has the next one, and it's, as owner of a small company, when your supervisor and one of the employees don't like each other, and that reflects on the work negatively, yes, since they can't always agree on everything, what's better to do? Is it to take, take in charge with the employee directly instead of the supervisor and let the supervisor do other things because you don't want to lose the employee or supervisor? What I recommend in these cases and it's not abnormal. That's the other thing that I would say, Mahmoud. You, you get more than, you know, five, eight, six people in, in a room. Some of them aren't going to get along. And the more closely they work together, the more that shows up. So, Mahmoud, what I'd actually do is I would actually bring these two individuals into the office. And I would have a very frank conversation with them, a very transparent conversation. But this is a situation where you are controlling it. And so what you want to do is talk through what you have seen and talk through specifics. So in this case last Friday, 
we had this pop up and I saw the two of you disagreeing on what to do in regards to it. And what ended up happening is we got, you know, half the productivity out of both of you because both of you weren't working together. That can't happen. So you're very clear and you're very strong in this case. Now, you can ask them, well, what were you thinking in this situation? Okay, so you can ask them. But this is not a discussion between those two individuals. And this is how I handle most interpersonal communications between employees. All right. So ask them what they were thinking. Ask the other person what they were thinking. But you are mediating the discussion and then you come up with, I want to say, the, the talking points and the common ground. So what I hear from you, Cameron, is that you want the employee to do whatever it is that you say your final decision. And the employee wants their ideas heard. They're not feeling like they're being heard. So the simple solution to this is that you give them the, the minute to, um, and I'm just walking through just a, a created situation, you give them time to say their idea for a couple minutes. Your role is to trust that they have taken this into account, all of the factors, and that you need to go forward with this. All right, so you, you talk through this, but what you do is you tie everything to a higher goal. Hey, everybody wants an environment where we all get along, and, that, it, and, and we all want an environment that's productive. We all want to see all these orders shipped. We all want everybody to do really well. So you tie it to that important goal. I think about sports teams all the time, and all these prima donna professional sports players, they don't get along, but they all have the same goal. They want to score more points than the other team. That's the goal that unifies all of them. So make sure that you mention that particular goal. Then get real. And that is, hey, we're not all going to get along. And that's fine. I don't expect you to all be best buddies who go out and have drinks after, after work every single day and hang out with each other's families on the weekends. But I do expect you to get the work done. And this is how we're going to do it. All right. So you, you, you talk them through this thing. You air out their grievances. You align themselves behind a common goal. And you're real about the dynamics that is right there staring everybody in the face. And that is that not everybody in an organization is going to get along. But having that conversation, and it's difficult, don't get me wrong, you're going to have to go through five or six of these, and hopefully not with the same two employees, before you start getting really good at it. But when you do, you can nip that interpersonal stuff right in the bud so it doesn't affect performance because everybody under, has a better understanding of where everybody else is coming from, what their goals are, and how they interact with one another in a real way. Um, again, great question, Mahmoud, uh, for us. Uh, Doroth, glad you liked it. Melissa, thank you um, as well. I am caught up, so if you have a question here, Drop down into the comment section. I'm happy to answer it. Otherwise, you can de you can direct message me on Facebook or email me at cm at cameronmorsey.com if you want to do this more anonymously. I will definitely mask your uh, identity and the situation that you're dealing with in, in, in future episodes, in the next episode, really, is what I, what I target in all of these cases. So again, for those of you that have jumped on and have not um, tuned into the podcast, I will have a link in this video uh, after we're done here to jump over to iTunes or SoundCloud. I would love to have you jump on these podcasts. It's just an opportunity to give your brain a little bit of exercise in leadership, have it on in the background, thinking through situations. And that's the thing where if you t pull... One little thing that makes your life easier as a leader from every single episode or every other episode, that builds up huge over time. So I'm going to go ahead and sign off for today. I will be back over tomorrow. So any other questions, drop them into the comments and I'll tackle them tomorrow. Thanks so much, everybody. You have a great day out there. Bye-bye.